Hello and welcome to Café Stillpoint. My name is Anja Engel-Schulmeier and I'm really looking forward to introduce you to a very passionate osteopath who is doing osteopathy since 40 years and is still a passionate teacher and a passionate osteopath. She is my favorite teacher because she always boosts my perception every time I'm able to work with her. So I'm really happy to say hello to Sue Turner over in the UK. Hello, Sue. How are you doing over there? Hello, Anja. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Yeah, we are very happy to have you here, especially that you are healthy and you're looking so shining tonight. <laughs> That's very kind. Of Thank course. You. So, Sue, today you like to talk a bit of the aging process in the second half of life. It's always the questions, am I already in the second half of life with my over 40? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I do think osteopathy has a lot to offer in helping the decompensations of, and the, of, of the older years. And of course, we know, don't we, that there have been much research on the aging um, process and the, how it's benefited by exercise, by new learning, by social engagement, by keeping up interests, by having a good diet that's free from heated flats with, that produce free radicals, that not too much sugar and alcohol, that produces inflammation. And um, very important is hydration. But I want to show you a group of people who are exemplary examples of how we all hope to be when we get older. And these are and um, th these are Dr. Sutherland's students at a conference in Canada in the 1990s. And I'm going to use the cursor here. There's Anne Wales, um, who I, I think of as my beloved mentor, you know, more than, well, I have many people I'm grateful to, but particularly to her. That's Edna Lay. That's Alan Becker, the brother of Rollin. Um, I think that's Brooks Walker. And uh, I'm not sure of the other people. But they're in there, as I said, they're in their 80s and 90s. And, of course, they, they, they did live very healthy lives. And they were passionate about what they were doing right into their old age. They were they 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 kept exploring and discovering, and they were doing something that was very meaningful to them, and um, in service of other people. And this is all wonderful to keep the brain alive and make it worth living. But um, there is something interesting that is very relevant to the brain, that as we become older, obviously things slow down. But there is, counter to all that, a wonderful something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is active in the hippocampus and the basal floor brain and the cortex. And it is involved in learning long-term memory and in producing new neurons and synapses and, uh, and making brain plasticity possible right at, at any age. So if you do learn things and you're passionate about things and you're socially engaged and you take exercise, the, the, the brain will produce new blood flow, increased blood flow into those areas of the brain that are um, activated. And uh, here is Anne Wales at the age of 100. She was in an old people's home in, in her, at 99. She uh, had a, a a, a temperature, a fever, and um, I think collapsed and lost the use of her legs. But you can see how she is still so interested and so engaged in what she loves, which is meeting other osteopaths and talking about what she's been exploring all her life. And in fact, it is very important to carry on learning and never stop. She never stopped, but also something very revealing about her is that somebody asked her, 
when does the embryonic process stop? And she said, I don't know. I'm still in it. And I don't know if that's related to, uh, well, something Dr. Still said, but um, uh, no, I won't go into that particularly. But may I but, ask a question before, Sue? Yes, go on. Probably we will see you in 40 years on a picture and you had a very interesting study group as well. Can we spend some more words about your study group? Because it will look, there, there have been a lot of famous people in there as well. And we will see a picture with, I think, Jane Carrero, you and some other people from your study group. Who When was it? <laughs> yes. Do you mean the New England, New England, Old England study group? Yes. Yes. Well, in 1988, um, uh, Jim Jealous very, very kindly invited me to uh, spend a week with him in his practice, where I learned an awful lot. And in that week, he was going to Anne Wales's study group, who had been going three years by that time. And um, so I met all of her, all of the people studying with her. And Jim and I decided to uh, have a week where the English cranial faculty, of which Nick Woodhead was the leader at that time, and the Anne Wells' study group, that we would meet in Bar Harbor in northern Maine. And in that week, a lot of friendships were cemented and a very good interaction between the two osteopathy on the two sides of the Atlantic much more than there had been before. And yes, Jane Carrero was there. And uh, Nick wasn't there on that one, but he was the following year in when we uh, had another meeting in Devon. Okay, that sounds great. Must have been a lot of fun and a lot of interchange between you. Yes, yes, it's meant a huge amount to me, that connection ever since. Yes, it, yes, it's very precious. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> And um, so when I think of osteopathy, I don't know, it's very difficult to define, isn't it? But when I think of a patient, even subconsciously now, these things go my, through my mind. The engagement with the life, this miracle of life within the human being, which we didn't create ourselves, life Life is breathing us, not because we put it there, but by some miracle, some creating and sustaining miracle. And so we engage with that with our patients. We all, there are also environmental factors, nutrition, environment, daily life, etc. And then Dr. Sutherland said that the purpose of an osteopathic treatment is to affect a more efficient interchange between all the fluids of the body, extracellular and intracellular, and Anne Wales would add, and of course that's physiology. So I'm looking for this sense of interchange, the hormonal and the neurotrophic flow, the vascular arterial and venous, and the lymphatic, the, the, the lymphatic and cerebrospinal fluid flow, that wonderful interchange of fluids. And within that, there's rhythmicity. Does the body have rhythm? We look for breathing, we look for cerebrospinal fluid rhythm, primary respiratory motion. But in fact, all the organs have their own rhythm and together they make a, a kind of symphony of body rhythms. And where we find no, no rhythm, there is stasis. And we can be sure that there is no fluid interchange where there's stasis. And in Dr. Still's terminology, that would be the, 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 the basis of disease because um, there is no nutritive flow and no clearing of waste. And then we have the axial center, the cranial, the neurospinal axis um, that is that's axially organized, but also segmental. And, um, and then of course, the wonderful continuity of connective tissues The, all the investing fascial containers of the organs, the bones, the muscles, the nerves, right down to the cell. And these three-dimensional compartments within the body, one within each other, one within another, and with, it, with each other, must be in the right relationship. So we hope 
there will not be fascial drag. And fascial drag is something I'm going to think about particularly with reference to the central nervous system. And speaking of the fascia, some of you probably know this diagram. William Sutherland in 1931 was um, rather shy about his discovery of the cranial concept. So he wrote under the title of Blunt Bone Bill. And his, the title of his article was How to Ring the Ethmoid Bell by the Sacrum. So even then he was thinking about how the fascia of the body, the sacrum, the craniotobical complex affected what was happening within the head right up to the ethmoid. And I think that analogy is very nice. I don't know if you can think of a, a church, a, when, a, when a church bell rings in the steeple, somebody down at the base is pulling it and releasing it and pulling it and releasing it to make the bell ring. So I'm going to explore a little bit more about that because what William Sutherland said was fascial drags and sacral sags make chronic rags. And don't we know that feeling both in ourselves and in our patients when everything seems to pull down, when we've lost that up with that sense of uplift, that sense of the, tur the turgidity as you would get in a healthy plant that lifts you up and um, makes you feel free of the pull of gravity. And this phrase came from a journey he made when he was just a young doctor. He had to go to visit a woman who had just delivered a child, or maybe she was about to deliver. But anyway, he was a rural doctor. He went in his horse and cart and the mud was so deep that one of the wheels broke. So he got off his cart and, and rode his horse. Then he saw the woman he'd come to see, who was a little bit crazed and distracted and clearly in a state of perhaps um, what would now be called most postnatal illness. So he put her on his horse and led her back to the farm and was astounded that by the time she reached the farm, she had retained, regained her composure. She was no longer a little bit crazy. So most people, many of us would have just said, oh good, I don't have to worry about that anymore. That's, um, that's, that's worked out nicely. But he was a great questioner and he said, why? What is it about the sitting on the horse? What is it about the 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 um, the need for the legs to grasp the horse um, that that would have lifted the sacrum and I think thinking of a postpartum woman I can't really imagine that she would want to sit on a horse it must have been quite painful and I wonder if she was um, sitting a little bit high um, to keep her pelvis away from the saddle but anyway it had the desired effect because he, he figured out that with, with, the, with the labor, the sacrum had descended like a wedge between the ilia and was no longer able to lift and release and lift and lift and drop and, and rotate, circumrotate, inflection and extension, so that you'll get, you got a downward dragging on the whole dural tube and on the reciprocal tension membrane. And of course, if you fix the reciprocal tension membrane, you deprive the brain of venous drainage because it's that rhythmic motion of the falx cerebri and the tentorium, falx cerebelli, that allows these veins in these valveless venous sinuses to, to uh, pump the blood out of the head and release the brain from its... Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's problem state and uh, release the toxins. I'll just check. Oh, yes. OK. So what was he thinking? He wrote, oh, I'm sorry, he wrote, he wrote an article called um, Fascial Drag and the Fulcrum. <clears throat> and that is in um, uh, Contributions of Thought, I believe. Uh, 
his book Contributions of Thought. And in that, he has uh, also emphasizes the anterior longitudinal ligament of the spine. Now, he's very interested in the areas where the anterior structures connect with the anterior longitudinal ligament, which you see this anterior longitudinal ligament, it's not just anterior and posterior. Those two together form a kind of tube, a spinal stocking, which we can engage with when we want to treat the spine um, very safely and precisely. So here we have the sacro-uterine ligament. Well, we can't see it there, but that the, the uterus is attached to the sacrum and the cell pelvic floor can create great fascial drag. When the pelvic floor is released, the fascias of the body all lift and it's an extraordinary thing to feel. And then, of course, you've got the, um, the, the crura, and the median arcuate ligament, which has a huge force when you breathe. And of course, when breathing is inhibited as it is when people get old and tired uh, or are suffering from um, recovering from chest infections, um, then that creates great drag. And Sutherland observed that it creates drag through the anterior longitudinal ligament right up to the basi occiput. And through that avenue also interfering with the Sutherland, the movement of the Sutherland fulcrum, which he preferred to call the automatic shifting suspension fulcrum. So, and then of course, uh, we have the prevertebral fascia as well, just in front of the anterior longitudinal ligament, running free from the basi occiput to the upper thoracic spine. Um, so, um, and, and that, um, he, he, he attributed to the old age symptoms, uh, the old age center, the dowager's hump or the cervicothoracic kyphosis, where uh, you get drag on the anterior long, the prevertebral fascia. Uh, and so we're looking at fascial drag, not just in terms of physiology, which it's very relevant for, but also its effect on the brain itself. Um, sorry, I'm going backwards and forwards here. Um, this is a dissection done by Jane Professor Jane Carrero and Frank Willard. It's a beautiful dissection, I think, and it really shows the reciprocal tension membrane, the way the falx adjoins the, the tenth to form the Sutherland fulcrum, and the complete tension in all directions that it's under. And how clearly we see there that if the Sutherland fulcrum is dragged down, you will not get that pumping action through the, through the venous sinuses. Um, he, he, Dr. Sutherland spoke of the crura of the diaphragm as uh, and the median arcuate ligament is the most important physiological plug in the in the body. Um, where, where you, you can see here that if that is locked down in a tight diaphragm, grief, shock, accumulated griefs of older, older years, um, sagging posture, that you're going to inhibit the flow of lymph and you're going to inhibit the downward flow of arterial blood together with the, uh, the rocking of the, all the vital organs that's necessary and necessarily supported by the rhythmic mov movement of the diaphragm. And this little um, drawing here shows how if you have, if, if this is inhibited, you're going to get d diminution in blood flow to the adrenals to the kidneys and to the uh, to the splanchnic area to the stomach, inhibiting digestion. So that's just it's a long, long topic, but it does just one of the one the, the, a few of the many interferences with uh, physiology that you get from a tight diaphragm. And the air, the illnesses of old age, you can see poor digestion diminution of blood flow to the kidney, which raises 
high, uh, the blood pressure, the renin angiotensin tendon response, um, adrenal dysregulation. And of course, doctors still talked about the goat and the boulder. And this story, it, it talks about a goat who lived um, on a mountain and he was running down the mountain trying to push a boulder and he couldn't. So he tried and tried and tried and then he exploded, which is a very sad story, but it illustrates that the, 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 the mountain path is the aorta, the blood is the goat, and the boulder in the mountain path is the um, arcu median arcuate ligament between the crura. And so he's, he's, he, he was saying this to illustrate that long-term tightness of the diaphragm, uh, wears, long chronically strains the valves of the heart and undermines the heart greatly. So we do need to attend to what fascially drags the, the, the cranium down and um, interferes with the physiology of the brain. But we've also, that, that was thinking of the, the posterior structures close to the spine. But we also have an anterior fascial column, which creates drag on the cranial base. And here we have the pharyngobasilar fascia attaching to occiput, sphenoid and a pterygoid plates, up to the sphenoid and the, uh, the temporal bones. We have the, the constrictors stricter muscles and we have the deep cervical fascia continuous with the aortic arch the pericardium and the diaphragm itself so you can see how this anterior fascial column and a congested liver will uh, produce a uh, fascial drag down on the cranial base from that view also and perhaps um, on this uh, this diagram you can see the anterior longitudinal, the uh, prevertebral fascia, which I mentioned before. And of course, thinking about the endocrine system and the way particularly women postmenopausally can have a tendency to low thyroid, we see that the thyroid is enveloped in this fascial column, this, uh, this, this continuous fascial column. And its circulation makes it very vulnerable to uh, fascial drag because its arterial supply has to go up and then down to reach it. Its venous drainage has to go up and then down to escape. And so you can see how alterations in posture, um, sagging posture, kyphotic posture, uh, influences from below will, can easily contribute to the disturbance of the thyroid. So we, we start to see a picture of how clearly fascial drag does, in fact, affect physiology. And also, we see behind the sternum the transversus thoracis muscle, this strange fan behind the sternum. My experience is that where people are recovering from chest infections or they have great uh, sorrow or depression, there's a residual continuing tension in these muscles which uh, pull down the front of the thorax. And by engaging with the sternum, but actually not with the sternum, but engaging with what is behind the sternum, you can actually match these tensional forces here and release so that you start to feel a lift coming back up again. And of course, that's very related to the, the, the feeling also of a heavy heart. We don't use language accidentally. That is a sensation that a person feels. And on palpation, we can feel that sometimes the, the heart, it feels as if the pericardium actually is dragged down where the diaphragm is tight, where a person's post viral, where they're depressed, um, where their posture is collapsed. I'm going on to think about the brain now. Uh, Anya, did you have anything you wanted to raise or does anybody? No, at the moment I'm quite clear about what you said. I'm always fascinated by the diaphragm because you're always able to, when you are teaching, you, I think your favorite technique is the 12th rib or 
<laughs> you really like to do BLT on the 12th rib. And it's always fascinating when you are talking about what you feel about the stasis in lymph flow. And yeah, that's, that's what I really like. And at the sternum, I was just today, I was thinking about you because I was treating a patient after Corona and there was really tension in the transverse thoracic muscle. And it was quite interesting how, yeah. how, how, how it felt afterwards. So thank you for sharing this. Well, thank you, Anya, because it brings me to, I don't know if you know, our colleague in America, Dr. Hugh Etlinger, runs an osteopathic department in St. Barnabas' Hospital in New York. And during the corona epidemic, um, when it was at its height in New York, they stopped treating their normal patients and they, the whole, his whole department became a corona ward. And he said universally what those patients had both during, during their illness was incredibly tight crura of the diaphragm, which of course are continuous with the arcuate ligaments and 12th ribs, and also the cervicothoracic junction. Um, and and the, the, he, he, he engaged with those very much in trying to reverse the effects of corona. So I'm interested that you found that. And also, did you find this feeling of stasis as if the tissues were sort of glued together and uh, couldn't get their feeling of spaciousness and fluid interchange? Yes, it was something, the whole thorax was not able to go into expansion. It was like it was really stuck in that internal rotation. That was yes. what I felt. Yeah. Did you notice a, a, a positive change in the patient? Because post-corona patients, I find, take, take a little longer to get a good result in, I find, than just normal post-viral syndrome. Yes, I mean, it was my first corona patient, so I have not so many examples at the moment. Or, um, But what was interesting that he always said, I, feel, I felt depressed. I thought it was a depression, but now I feel like, no, it was not a depression. It was a weight on my, on my sternum, which is now much lighter after the treatment. That have been his words today, so it was, yeah, I was very happy to hear that. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for of sharing course. that. We, we should really make a, a, a kind of collective diary between the whole osteopathic community about what we find in our post-COVID patients. I think it would be so interesting. So we already started. <laughs> you did. Good. Good, good. So, so you are moving something on your table because we have a constant noise. It's a mouse. You are, you are moving on the table. I can hear a noise too, but it's, I don't think it's just me. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. I hope it's not distracting. It's okay. Um, so the other thing is now we think about the, the, the brain itself. One of the things that happens where you get either sacral sag or compression of the sacrum between the ilia is that you automatically get a locking down of the occiput on the atlas, a locking of the condylar parts of the of, of the occiput into the anterior convergent posterior divergent atlas facets and it's as if this this occipital atlantal relationship and the lumbosacral relationship are reciprocal they influence each other and if we think of the um the the, the flow of arterial blood that has to go from the uh from the the, the vertebral uh, the vertebr the vertebral arteries that have to come up from the spical spine into the uh, through the foramen magnum it's it's um, if the occiput is compressed onto the atlas that's going to create problems with blood flow to the lower brain and to the cerebellum which um, brings us back also to how we make sure that the brain is nourished, particularly when, particularly in the older years. It's also um, the blood flow to these very important physiological centers in the, in the brain stem, to the fourth ventricle, um, the, the centers of uh, respiration and 
cardiac um, control. So freeing the occiput from the atlas is going to be very important for uh, uh, bringing the brain back into its ability to float on its cisternas, which brings me on to the next point, which is our dear Professor Frank Willard, uh, who has brought so much in insight into and enjoyment of anatomy um, to Europe and to the world. Uh, is, he commented many years ago that in older cadavers, he noted that the, bra the, 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 the brain stem had sunk, the pons and medulla had sunk down the clivus. They'd, they'd slid down the clivus. And what they were doing, he says, in his words, they were using the cranial nerves, particularly the ocular motor nerve, as ligaments um, and hanging off, hanging off them. In, and as a result, that was straining the... The, the nerves to the ex, extraocular muscles and particularly to the eye itself um, from the ocular motor. But it was also meaning that the brain did not have quite so much float. It li lay lower on the cranial base um, than, it, than it did in a younger person. Now, we know now that when older people's, um, when people have what we call, let's call it brain sag, because that's a that's a, a, a phrase that has been adopted in um, me medical circles. It's not taken notice of because that's thought of as just a factor of aging. Um, but in, and because the brain after the age of 50 uh, doesn't secrete so much cerebrospinal fluid, so hydration is incredibly important. But this tendency of the brain to sag is actually very relevant to its function. And there is a syndrome called frontotemporal brain, brain sagging syndrome, which is so they, there were, I think, I remember 25 or 30 people over the age of 50 who uh, had the beginning of Alzheimer's disease and they were, their brains were scanned. And what showed was um, almost universally, there was less floating on the cisternas, there was less cerebrospinal flu fluid volume, giving that sense of sinking. The cerebellum was low, and there was uh, the cisternas loss of vertical height. And this appeared to coincide with frontotemporal dementia and in his disinhibition of uh, inappropriate behavior, behavioral changes, decreased cognition, emotional vibrancy, and vitality. And in severe cases, um, there was a wider gait with subliminal ataxia and slowing of mental and all faculties. And you can get this not just, not just with old age, but you can also get it with um, concussion, medication, dehydration. And um, if you think of uh, a failed epidural where there is a little bit of leakage of cerebrospinal fluid, uh, I've, I've known women say that this kind of describes how they feel. And, um, but it doesn't, it's not the end of the world because with osteopathy, we do have something to offer here. We can, we can prevent the early decompensation of old age becoming chronic by re-establishing fluid dynamics and attending to the posture, attending to both the pulmonary and primary respiration and attending to the integration of all five phenomena. So all is not lost. So let's think about this. Can I ask a question, Sue? Do yeah. you know um, about the third cranial nerve, about the oculomotorius nerve? Um, I, I, that you're a little indistinct too. Can you say it again, Anya? Yes, I'm, it's just a question about the role of the of the third cranial nerve, the oculomotor nerve. Yes. Does it really does it change the structure? Becomes it more collagenous, or is there a change in the structure? Did Frank say something about this, or is it 
it's it's the same nerve material or because if it's used as a ligament i don't know anya um this is just an anecdotal to do with what frank willard said really but he said he thinks a lot of the diseases of old age the, the problems of old age are to do with dehydration and that the visual problems many of the visual problems and uh, de degenerating eyesight that one of the factors is that drag on the, the those nerves that have to negotiate the anterior reaches of the tent before they go through to the um extraocular to supply the extraocular muscles that's cranial nerve third fourth and sixth and uh cranial nerve five also plays a part in the in the eyes so he didn't say anything about the texture i don't know if he noticed but uh he did feel that um the the drag on the nerve and on the vasa nervorum the blood supply around the nerve uh, could int could be it could explain some of the degenerative changes to do with eyesight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay. Now, um, you're, I don't know how many of you are aware of this. It's quite well known now, but in um, 2012 and then 2015, um, J Jeffrey Eiliff and his team uh, we're able to scan the brain with tracking dyes and see that the uh, cerebrospinal fluid from the vault, from the periphery, and here you see it in this beautiful arachnoid membrane. This is a, an unfixed dissection by Dr. Joe Grasso in America. This uh, spider's delicate filigree spider's web that the cerebrospinal fluid is drawn down into the brain to flush it and um, and it's thought that this uh, is one of the mechanisms whereby rogue proteins associated with Alzheimer's um, are flushed away through the, through the intervention of the cerebrospinal fluid and uh, th this is great because it makes sense of what we osteopaths have been feeling for for decades. But the other thing is um, that this relates to, sorry, to what um, Sutherland alluded to, which is this is the third ventricle in, um, uh, in section above the pituitary. And um, this is the what we, Sutherland called the ventricular bird, the third ventricle as the body of the bird, the tail the aqueduct of Sylvia's fourth ventricle central canal, and the wings of the bird, uh, the lateral ventricles. Now what he observed and what makes sense on palpation totally is that on the flexion phase, or we call it primary inhalation, this third ventricle will lift and widen on extension primary exhalation, will drop and narrow and this rhythmic motion um, is associated with the turning of the sphenoid towards flexion because it is posterior to the axis of motion of the sphenoid, of the body of the sphenoid. Now, I don't know if it's a familiar feeling to any of you. When someone has actually either had a, a, a virus, a shock, they're exhausted, and sometimes in the sort of exhaustion of older age, it's as if the instead of this feeling of expansion and widening and lifting of the ventricular system of the brain in primary inhalation and um, dropping in extension, primary exhalation, there is only the downward sense, the downward sense of this third ventricle just dropping and of the that person's primary mechanism being drawn towards the midline as if it's gone down a plug hole in the middle. I, I, and I just say to people, this treatment is about re-establishing your lift, your inner lift. Forget the strained ankle. Unless we get this 
sense of lift and vitality and rhythmic interchange back. We can't actually get anywhere with the ankle. Um, so it, fascial drags and sacral sags make chronic rags, but actually that sense of inner lift isn't just about the fascia. It is also about the sense of the longitudinal tide and this sense of ignition and primary respiratory motion that lifts and widens this body of the ventricular bird and spreads its wings um, and then folds them again on the extension phase. And that is that to me is crucial, that movement of the cerebrospinal fluid and the brain together in synchrony with the reciprocal tension membrane in the cranial bones. That, that is essential to healthy function. And what I found is when I say to people, I'm sorry, you've just collapsed in your midline and gone down a plug hole, they, they, they don't mind I'm a little bit crazy. Um, I, I just know we can't get anywhere until that, that is, is resolved because they also complain about being depressed and also as if they are hyperreactive to anything going on around them, as if they have no electromagnetic bioelectrical field protective envelope. And there is something uh, here that reminds me of that Anne Wales told us that in Sutherland's time, they used to talk about the brain battery or a dynamo, a self-recharging -re battery that on the flexion phase, uh, when primary inhalation creates a positive charge, on the extension primary exhalation phase, a negative charge. So you've got this alternating, uh, alternating charging and discharging of the neurons. And that makes total sense to me because when that is working, you can almost feel the field, the energy field building up around the person and becoming protective again. And I relate this very much to the importance in older age when people can feel so vulnerable, so physically weak and so powerless, really, and so um, affected by things. It's almost it's it's wonderful to feel almost that there's a robustness and uplift and rhythmicity and protective auric or electromagnetic field returning. I don't know if anybody has uh, felt that um, kind of thing. Uh, I'm sure you have, somebody. There's nobody speaking. Nobody Look out. wants to speak. <laughs> so questions are appreciated. You can type them in, in the YouTube channel. Of course, Sue will answer to them. So please feel invited. But I think everybody is impressed by your description of what you feel. Well, it's funny. I think it's worth naming the funny things you feel, the little crazy things, because sometimes when other people say that's what they felt, people will say, or I've said, no, ah, that's what I've been feeling. I did. I felt it. I didn't know what it was. And so I think we all need to share our little bits of crazy, crazy experiences. So thinking of Jeffrey Eiliff and his article in what he called the glymphatics because uh, he it, it because he was relating the cerebrospinal fluid <clears throat> to the uh, lymphatics of the brain now we do now know that the there are lymphatic vessels in the venous sinuses that was discovered a little later than this um, but you can see this nice diagram here from some of the subarachnoid space the fluid the cerebrospinal fluid is drawn in along the paravascular pathways and the glial linings um, into the depths of the brain and then out to blend with the brain extracellular fluid and then carry these waste products back into the venous system. And um, this is, this, as I said before, he related this to Alzheimer's disease, but for, because of the um, amyloid beta proteins that are a waste product and a, and a normal waste product, but if they're not carried away, they are a problem. They become destructive to nerve tissue. But if it's true of 
Alzheimer's, is it not true of our everyday clearing of the waste and the, the, the other, the waste products that might produce other neurological deficits? Um, it's, uh, just a, it's very important for the, the flushing of the, of the central nervous system. <clears throat> so and, a question. It, yeah, cool. Since you know that, that um, research from ILIF, did it change something on your perception or does it, does it really, or is it what you felt before? It's what I'm always asking myself, if research changes my perception. Yes, well, it, it is. I mean, because I remember um, a physiologist in the 1990s saying, cerebrospinal fluid, what are you osteopaths talking about? It's just brain pee. Uh, and another one said, oh, it's only a filtrate of blood. But in fact, it's a filtrate of blood that's produced with great specificity and with great uh, taking a lot of um, energy from the body in it to, to make it specific. Um, and, and so, yes, I felt the presence of the cerebrospinal fluid and it's beautiful feeling when it, you get a sort of little whisper of a sort of perfusion through the brain tissue and that beautiful spaciousness coming back into the brain. Um, and, and also we do the cerebrospinal fluid techniques, but now those lateral fluctuation of the cerebrospinal fluid technique, the, the CV4, the, the fluid drive V-spread, they all make a lot more sense. And we almost, um, <clears throat> well, we don't need permission to feel what we feel, but it does help actually um, when you can then communicate <clears throat> a little bit more but with research behind you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Just another question. Sometimes it's hard for me to really feel the difference between fluid and and healthy brain tissue. Do you really feel or can you give us some words about your perception about this is brain, this is fluid? I sometimes find it hard. Well, What's the sense? What's the sensory difference? Mm -hmm. Do you mean? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. Actually, I'd really have to think about that. But what what um what is good to look at is does it feel as if it's per there's a sense of perfusion and lightness and breathing or respiration between your hands? Or does it feel kind of dense or um, like a bit of liver? <laughs> okay. I think I think questions like that because what what does it feel like? Where there is motion and where there is a feeling of fluidity, there's usually the body's getting on with healthy function. Where it feels as if there's stasis, there's there's no movement. The tent is tight. Um, And yes, as I say, there's a feeling of kind of density between your hands. Those tissues are not healthy. They are not draining because they're not draining. Um, they're not able to be have access to nutritive, nutritive blood flow. Mm -hmm. But um, if I want to uh, sense the brain, the palpation of the brain, I think for me, I start with my hands on the outside of the head and I I feel I ask Anne Wales's question is how am I move, how is this moving my hands how do I make my hands just simply receptive and available to be moved by this and and then between my hands there is a shape is it a twisted shape is it a nice breathing shape that feels light or is it pulling in one direction or another and that awareness of what's between your hands that there is something between your hands is helpful to then go and say and engage with the, the feeling of the ventricular bird in the middle and then everything between that ventricular bird and your hands that's pulled in by brain tissue that's my kind of way around it i don't know if that makes sense yes it makes sense <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you for this, sharing your experience. Yeah, because sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm asking myself, is it now the brain? Is it fluid? Especially if I have healthy persons on my table, because then everything feels really fluidic and I'm, I am not sure if I can really differentiate between fluid and the parenchyma or really the brain tissue in But healthy I, persons. That's it. Anya, I think I, to me, I think I would say that's a sign of health. If you can't feel the, the, the any any sort of distinction, it means there's proper perfusion of the breath of life through all those tissues almost homogeneously. But would you say the same for an unhealthy person? What, what do you feel on an unhealthy person? Yes, I can agree that I feel density. And I always ask, yeah, it's, it's a stasis I feel. I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, density and stasis, heaviness. Space? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because yeah, on Sutherland, it's you know what's a really fun thing to do is look through Sutherland's books, contributions of thought and teachings in the science of osteopathy, and um, look for all the times he um, mentions looking at the minute, minute spaces, the spaces between, just as he liked thinking about reading between the lines of Doctor Still thinking of really the tiny, tiny spaces in, in the body, between the cells, you know, etc. And I think that's a lovely thing to engage with. It, it takes you more to the inside, doesn't it? Yes, yes, it's good. Yeah. And if you're looking for the spaces, but all you can feel is a kind of lump um, or, or a sort of uh, undifferentiated, unmoving structure, then you know what the body's longing for is to find its sense of breathing space within. Yes, but I always, yes, yes, I totally agree. And, but I always like to pronounce that healthy tissue, it just feels healthy. You feel that it's breathing, there is nothing. I, I'm not sure if we really can differentiate between brain tissue between fluids in the brain if I, if we have healthy persons we are treating i think it yes, just feels yes. healthy <laughs> yes and um it reminds me dr still said something about the, the 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 physiology dancing for joy okay yeah that's a good impression because <laughs> that when that lovely movement is like a to me like a dancing <laughs> so um, I'm back. I'm back with the ventricular birds, the bird of this rising and widening of like the lungs of the bird in this third ventricle. And when that's when that's working properly, you've got so many physiological centers here: the pituitary, um, the pineal, particularly the hypothalamus, the thalamus, um, and and then you've got these this lovely widening motion and primary inhalation of the of of the um, lateral ventricles and uh, to me that's such a good indication of um, of of either depletion or or health and it seems to be associated with a health not just physical but spiritual and emotional as well as i said when that's When that's working properly, you you sense this like this sort of aura, the strong aura of of life energy around the person. But um, I think it takes us also to the pineal and the fact that health is a, a spiritual thing as well as a physical thing. So here we have our bird. Now, if we come and we engage with our own or the patient's Sutherland fulcrum, we have just in front of it the cisterna superior, and then we have this little pineal, which is bathed in fluid posteriorly, and by the third ventricle bathed in fluid anteriorly. It's the size of a grain of rice, it's more vascular than any other organ. And Sutherland talked about it moving with the, 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 the Sutherland fulcrum and flip-flopping to shepherd the fluid down through the cerebral aqueduct. 
And um, this regaining of primary respiratory movement of the, of the ventricular bird and the proper movement and drainage of the uh, reciprocal tension membrane, when it also is free from fascial drag from below, it um, takes us to Dr. Still's words that really say we are not just dealing with the body. What he said, man's existence in form is the effect of life. The body's just the effect. What is really the mystery is the life. He says the cause with a capital C antedates him in mind and deed. His life or spirit must be the cause of his form. And I think at any time in life, this connection with our sense of life, the miracle of being alive and of our spirit is hugely important. But particularly in the second half of life, I, it's almost as if when you come into the world, you come from the universal. You come from the universal spirit, if you like. The universal life. And as you go into the second half of the life, you're beginning the path of return where the fulcrum needs to become more and more um, of a deeper meaning. Of, of a sustenance that comes from, what shall we say, what, no name. <laughs> now, Ronin Becker, this is from Ronin Becker's book, The Stillness of Life. It's from a chapter where he's talking to Sutherland, his beloved teacher, a series of letters and talking about his experiences and struggling, as we all do, to make sense of what we're feeling and to put it in a larger context of a meaning of, of life itself. So it's, this, this has been um, formalized a little in, 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 in graphics, but he talks about the breath of life, which he also said was the most powerful force in the, in the universe and, um, and identical with the creative force of the universe. And of course, mysterious, that actually breathes into the pineal. And in the pineal, there is a transmutation process. And this goes back in many, many traditions, the pineals um, referred to as the third, eye, the third eye, with light sensitive cells that are sensitive to the light we don't see with our ordinary eyes subtler forms of light. And that this itself ignites the potency in the cerebrospinal fluid in the third ventricle. And that force is distributed around the body into the ligamentous articular system, the membranous articular system, the pituitary endocrine orchestra, and the whole autonomic nervous system, with the aim of, as Sutherland said, body fluid interchange, a more efficient interchange between all tissue surfaces. But the interchange is in the body, the fluids of the body, the interchange is also between our own system and a higher awareness, a higher function of the breath of life. So that's also rhythmic balance interchange. Um, and I'm going to go back. Um, to, to this, because um, this is very significant for me, that this to, to be aware of the pineal. With, 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 we're shown always, we've always been taught to center in our Sutherland fulcrum before we start working and be aware of the patient's Sutherland fulcrum when we work. But my question is, are we really in our Sutherland fulcrum or are we actually just a tiny bit ahead of that in our pineal. Because when Dr. Sutherland said, my thinking, feeling, seeing, knowing, fingers are guided intelligently by the master mechanic who, guide, who made this mechanism, it matters not what we call it so long as our mental trolley is on the wire. This pineal, this southern fulcrum that is so close, 
this is the mental trolley on the wire, this being receptive to this larger something that we're all a part of that breathes the whole of life. And so when it comes to osteopathy, we attend to fascial drag from below. We attend to the releasing of particularly the occipitoatlantal junction to give the occiput itself space to breathe laterally and medially, the breathing of the bone to yield to uh, the, the, the fluctuation of the cerebrospinal fluid in those lower cisterna magna into pedunculari cisterna pontis, which will support and float the brain. And when we really are satisfied that that is so, what is a wonderful, such a simple technique is the parietal lift. If we look at this um, diagram on the right and we see these uh, transverse sinuses, the posterior parietal, the parietal parietomastoid area, the inferior lateral angle of the parietal will come uh, very close, sometimes encompassing this little tiny bit of transverse sinus, which is also, of course, part of the tent. So if we lift, when we lift the parietals, we can just lift the bones. That will do great good. But if we actually take the parietal back out of its little notch here and then wait to give a little bit of lift until we feel the engagement of the sutural membrane, we can then shift our awareness to not just thinking of lifting the parietals, but lifting also the tentorium. And of course, when we lift the tentorium, we're also lifting the falx cerebri. And the brain itself. So there's a chance that the brain itself can refloat on, on its cisternas like a boat being uh, unbeat, like stopping being beached, but now floating. And of course, another thing you can do when you think of this is, I'm just coming back now, is, is, is the, yes, when you, another thing you can do when you, you do this, you can actually think of climbing the tent with your, in your mind until you've got the whole tent right up to the Sutherland fulcrum. And then let your mind come just a little anterior and there you're to the pineal. And sometimes it feels as if, if you acknowledge a parietal lift is also a lift of the central nervous system, it feels as if you then get this, in this lifting of the cerebral hemispheres, it's as if the bird spreads its wings and then move up and anteriorly, and I'm thinking of those poor cadavers of Frank Willard who had sunk on their cisternas, and perhaps maybe we can help some of some people to go right to the end of their life without sagging brains, um, with lovely floating brains. Um, I'd like to think that, and I'd like to think with the, res the help of the research that we have into the nature of the brain the importance of the cerebrospinal fluid, the negative effects of brain sag, that we have something to stop the deleterious downward um, trend of old, the older years to actually be healthy. I mean, obviously, there is an aging process that's natural, but may that aging process in our patients and in ourselves and in our colleagues, be a healthy, happy one. And here is somebody who is one of my heroes. Maybe he's yours too. He's 85 and still full of life. And he is sustained both physically, but particularly by something deeper than just the body. That's my last slide. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Sue, for sharing your experience. Maybe I am allowed to ask you one more question. Of course. Yeah. 
Because in lockdown, um, there's a lot of research that dementia really deteriorates or de or or the or person have really losing their memories and don't feel well anymore. So yes. I think that will be. I think there will be really a role for us because we can work with these older people, maybe help them to 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 be better again after after this this period of lockdowns and restrictions. So, yes. what is your experience working with people having Alzheimer's disease or kind of dementias? What is your expectations after treatment, or what do you feel? What it, what means improvement for you? Well, it's it's often hard to to say what 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 is doing what, um, because there are obviously many many factors. What I've noticed with old people who are, are slightly losing their focus, and I'm talking not just about patients here, but friends, that and family that if they've been on their own a lot, they're sometimes a bit out of focus. But as you listen to them and engage with who they really are, they come into their fo to focus and their minds start to work properly in that conversation. And it's the same with, I think, the body and the hands that are listening. The hands listen to the body uh, and, and to the being of the person. And that also reminds the body and the mind of what it can do, what its real nature is. And I can't say how, how much success, but um, I, think, I think our role is particularly in preventive care. And in, when things have gone a very long way, there is probably a limit to It seems there is a limit to what we can do, but we can do something um, to improve things a little. And if this process is caught early on, perhaps we can do more. And I think I think that what's happened in lockdown is there's been so much loneliness and less relatedness. And that relatedness, involvement, meaning... That's so important for making it worth staying on the earth uh, rather than withdrawing on one level at a time. Um, I haven't really answered your question, Anya, because it's a difficult one to answer. But um, because the changes are slight and they take a long time. And as I say, there are so many factors But one of them is, I think, the power of listening, both with the ears and and with the hands, that um, wakes up something that is present. Thank you. That helps. And that helps to be optimistic and and yeah, always to dig on, I would say, and to work with with older people. I think that's one of our of our role in the future when population always gets older and needs our help. Yeah. So because we're always working with pediatrics, women's health, that is very important, but I think working with old people can be, yeah, it, I think it's part of our role in the next years. Really yes. To go in, into this topic. Yeah. And it, these these processes, these, these sagging processes, they... They can happen quite early on, like in in the in the forties and fifties, and particularly after the menopause. So it's not just in the very old. We we need to nurture health before it goes downhill. That's a nice expression for it. <laughs> to go south or downhill is what you always say. <laughs> <laughs> so Sue, thank you very much for your for your presentation. It's always a pleasure to hear you talking about your experience, about your perceptions. It, yeah, it's always nice. You're working since 40 years and you are still so passionate about what you're doing and passionate about passing on your knowledge. And I, I'm a big thank you for that. 
I thank you too for the pleasure of this experience and that you've invited me. Okay, of course, I'm happy that you joined us. So, Sue, I would say, have a nice evening. Thank, Thank you. you for being with us. And I hope we will see latest 2022 in Women's Health Course in Vienna. But we hope maybe we see earlier. <laughs> If I, I will ever be able to come to UK or you to Vienna again. <laughs> I hope so. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. And thank bye you. Bye, bye everybody. So, wir sind wieder mal am Ende der Folge angekommen. Ich habe mich sehr gefreut, dass Sue Turner bei uns war. Um, I was very happy that Sue joined us tonight. And I can do a little bit of preview. Next Monday I will have another guest. So we will have another guest. It will be Carolyn Stone from the UK as well. And Claudia Knox will have an interview with her. So it will be very interesting to listen to that as well. And for our German listeners, Carolyn Stone gibt da bei uns im Dezember ein Postcredit für alle, die sich für das Stomatoknate, also das Schlund-Kiefersystem interessieren. Schaut es einfach rein am Montag. Carolyn ist immer eine Stunde wert, weil sie eine absolute Querdenkerin ist mit sehr innovativen Ideen. Deswegen, ich hoffe, wir sehen uns am Montag und bis dahin liked uns einfach auf Facebook, auf Twitter, auf Instagram, wherever. Wir sind immer happy, wenn ihr das tut und eure Erfahrung mit uns teilt. Gut, ich wünsche euch noch einen wunderschönen Abend. Genießt ihn, ruht euch aus und wir sehen uns am Montag. Baba.